Hello, my name is Diana Sunshine and I'm on the Coursera team that partners with the University of Colorado Boulder for the Master of Science in Electrical Engineering program. And we are very excited for today's webinar. Before we start, let's get familiar with the Zoom interface. If you take your mouse and you go over the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see the Zoom navigation and you're gonna see a little button that says Q&A. That's where you should ask your questions. We ask that you refrain from asking questions to begin with until the presentation is concluded. That way, many of your questions will probably be answered during the presentation. So now I would like to introduce you to today's panelists. We have Bob Erickson and Adam Sadov. Welcome. This is... <laughs> oh. Um... Okay, okay. So, so I'm Bob Erickson. I'm the interim chair of the Department of Electrical Computer and Energy Engineering, and I'm a professor in the area of power electronics. I'm Adam Sadov. I'm the graduate advisor in the department, one of several. And uh, today, Bob and I will be going over our third webinar. I'm Robin McClanahan, and I will be moderating the questions for you. Hey, welcome. We today are having our third webinar in a series, and today we'll be going into more details about the program, specifically about uh, how to enroll the tuition, the course requirements for those of you who are eager to get started this coming Monday. And at the end, we'll uh, entertain questions. <clears throat> Here's a brief overview of the online MSEE degree. It is 100% online. Even though it's self-paced, Students enrolled in a four credit session will be expected to complete and submit work by the eight week session end date. And for that reason, we do encourage you to enroll as close to the start of the session as possible to give yourself the most time possible to finish the coursework. Um, at the end of the four credit session, the session closes and all enrolled students are assigned a letter grade. This is a performance based admission. Students will only get admitted after completing three to four courses with a 3.00 grade point average or higher. And so there is no rounding up of 2.99. It's got to be solid 3.0 and higher. There are no designations on the transcript, certificate, or degree to indicate that this is an online program. Um, as an online MSEE student, you will earn the same credentials as our on-campus students. Your diploma will be the same, and you will have earned a fully accredited Master of Science. <clears throat> so the full program will begin in uh, January of 2020, and we will accept um, enrollments uh, starting in December. However, we're... <laughs> they can't hear the presenters. Oh. At all? Yeah. I'm not muted. I don't think so. Let me see. There's... Hello, can you hear? No? Oh, oh they're, they're able to heal. Here. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so I didn't change Do we need to repeat? Here, so okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> sorry for the rough start. So, let me start over this slide. Um, the, uh, yeah, the full program will launch in January of 2020. We will accept uh, enrollments beginning uh, on a date in the, this December. However, in October, we're going to run a limited uh, launch of three courses, each having enrollment limited to 75 people per course. And uh, 
So this is really where we are going to iron out the bugs. Um, for those of you who are interested in enrolling in this, we will accept um, enrollments on Monday, next Monday, uh, September 23rd, 21st, yeah. September 21st. Okay, that date is wrong. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, it's October 21st, September 23rd. September 23rd, okay. Correct. And uh, uh, so at 9 a.m. we will turn on the website and you'll be able to enroll if, if you like. Um, you will be able to enroll and at that time then tuition will be due. Uh, and we will um, turn on three courses one in power electronics, one in embedded systems, and one in optoelectronics. Okay, so if you've declared your intent to enroll uh, already, uh, then we will send you a link where you will be able to follow the link and enroll in um, uh, the, this limited run. If you have not declared your intent to enroll, then uh, two days later, if we still have space available in any of the courses, we'll send out um, emails that are an enrollment link that will be available to everyone. So uh, I would encourage you, if you're interested in this program, to declare your intent to roll, enroll in the degree program. Many of you already have. Um, but if you haven't yet, then uh, click on the URL in the chat box and uh, you'll be able to complete a short one minute form um, and be, get on our list um, for the program. Uh, unlike the non-credit version, students do not pay the monthly subscription fee for the four credit version. Students pay per credit hour, not per semester, which allows for maximum flexibility. Tuition is assessed on a pay-as-you-go, per-course basis. More information can be found in our course description pages. Currently, we only accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover Card. As this is a beta test session, please choose the one course that you want to take, be certain about it, and then make your payment. Upon paying your tuition, you'll be required to complete the onboarding course. It normally takes between an hour to a few hours to complete. The onboarding course does not affect your GPA by any means. This course provides more in-depth information about the program, how to use the Coursera platform, and the University of Colorado Boulder's policies. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, uh, we will have this limited uh, launch with three courses offered. Um, the courses themselves will start on October 21st. And each of the three courses is the beginning of a specialization in one of the areas of power electronics, embedded systems, or optics. So um, each four credit course, I guess, as Adam mentioned, is held in an eight week session. We will hold one eight week session beginning in October, this trial session. And then in January, we will start our regular run of eight week sessions throughout the calendar year. Um, <clears throat> so you can sign up for courses at your own pace. The courses expire after eight years. So uh, you need to, really will want to complete the degree within eight years um, uh, to get credit for all of the courses. Um, most students will, you know, we expect will complete the degree in perhaps two years. So uh, of the three specializations that we're launching on a trial basis uh, this fall, um, so in the power electronics area, the first course of the uh, power electronics specialization, uh, course introduction to power electronics will begin on October 21st. And again, you can uh, sign up for it uh, beginning on Monday, September 23rd. 
Uh, in January, the first session will start on January 13th. At that point, we will offer all four courses in the Power Electronics Specialization, as well as quite a few others. So on January 13th, uh, the, the four courses of the Power Electronics Specialization will be available. And this is one of the pathway specializations that you can use to gain admission into the, um, the degree program. In the embedded, uh, <clears throat> embedded systems area, we will offer the first course of the embedded sensors and motors specialization. Uh, so again, you can sign up for it next Monday if you like, and it will start on October 21st as well. And in January, the four courses of that specialization uh, will all be offered. Uh, and this, this also is one of the pathway specializations that you could use to gain entrance to the, um, the degree program. And finally, uh, on October 21st, uh, the, the first of the optics courses of the optical engineering specialization will be available. And in January, we will have all three of those courses um, operating. So as Dr. Erickson has just mentioned, on January 13th, 2020, additional specializations will roll out. Unlike the initial October launch, the January launch will have no enrollment limits. They'll be open to anyone who wants to study in any of the courses. We anticipate there will be about five additional specializations, which would be equal to about 27 courses. We've designed the program into focused, manageable topics to allow maximum flexibility. So towards the degree, you can take any 30 credit hours that you like in any order. Um, along the way or separately, you could take uh, certain types of courses for specific certificates, one or more certificates you can earn. And you could also do those standalone without the degree, either together with a degree or on their own. Um, courses are often offered for fractional credits, ranging from 0.6 credit hours to 1.2 credit hours. Each specialization consists of about three to four courses, which is equivalent to a regular three credit course on campus. The duration of time the coursework takes will vary student by student. Here's another diagram illustrating the uh, certificate and the degree pathway. So um, for the master's degree, again, we have a performance-based admissions process. Uh, you could start it as early as uh, next Monday by signing up for a, uh, one of our trial runs of a course. Um, so you can register, pay tuition, and enroll in a course beginning on Monday. Or of course, you could do this in December for the full rollout in, in January. Uh, in October, then you would take the first course in one of the three pathway specializations that we are initially offering. Um, if you pass all of the courses in a pathway specialization and maintain a grade point average of at least B, then you can uh, ask for admission to the, de the degree program and you're automatically admitted at that point. When you complete 30 credit hours, uh, with a maintaining a B average, then you can receive the diploma for the Master of Science in Electrical Engineering. And this also will appear on your regular uh, university transcript. For certificates, we offer a number of graduate certificates that typically require nine credit hours or possibly more. Uh, and again, the first course or the first specialization for, of these pathway specializations is also the first course of one of our graduate certificates. You may choose to pursue a graduate certificate without being enrolled in the master's degree program. And so you can simply take all of the courses in a, the certificate program, um, nine credits or more, uh, maintain a B average or higher, and you'll receive this University of Colorado Boulder graduate certificate. Uh, which will appear on your university transcript as well. 
you can at any time switch. So you could start with a graduate certificate, for example, and then change to the master's degree, or you can earn graduate certificates on your way to the master's degree. So as mentioned previously, we have a performance-based admissions process. If you want to be admitted to the Master of Science degree program, then you must complete one of the designated pathway specializations and maintain an average of at least B or higher in all the courses or over, over that uh, specialization. Um, <clears throat> in a certificate program, we have a requirement that to, to uh, earn the certificate, you must complete all of the courses with an overall average of at least B. We also offer non-credit versions of all of these courses. Um, and you can upgrade at any, any time from non-credit to for credit. So to do that, you, you may choose to sign up for the non-credit version through Coursera, uh, complete some or all of the homework. And whenever you decide to, you can upgrade to for credit by paying the tuition for the for credit course. When you do that, your homework that you've completed in the non-credit version will be automatically transferred to the four-credit course. Um, <clears throat> I, I would only note that the non-credit subscription fee uh, is not refunded when you transfer to the four-credit course, so you'll have to pay the tuition, the university tuition in addition. Uh, we've recommended that this is a good approach to, to take if you're not sure whether you can handle the work. You can sign up for non-credit, see how it goes. And if, if you feel you can handle it and want to get four credit, then you can upgrade to four credit. The only other thing I would point out though is that the non-credit courses do not have the course facilitators. So in the four credit version, we will have course facilitators that are like teaching assistants who will hold office hours, um, live office hours, and uh, uh, you'll be able to to get more personalized um, attention and instruction. <clears throat> As regards transfer credits, uh, currently the MSCE cannot accept transfer credits from another program. You may be able to transfer credits to ever earn for MSCE courses you take to another university or program at the discretion of the receiving institution. Uh, similarly, due to the accreditation, accreditation process for this new type of pioneering online degree, we are unable to offer scholarships or financial aid at this time. We know that cost is a consideration for everybody, and we ask you to understand that we've been able to greatly reduce the tuition um, of this program because of the online format. This is already considerably less than our on-campus program, and is also much more affordable than many other degree programs online. This is a pay-as-you-go program, and you'll be able to spread out the payments. And now we're ready to answer any other questions that you might have. Okay, we have a couple of good questions. Question number one, is it possible to get admission letters? This is required by lenders. Funding can't be possible without it. There's no admission. We don't have admissions, right? So, <laughs> yeah. It's performance based, so. So, yeah. no. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Question two How do exams take place? So, the exams are proctored. We will use the proctor use service. Uh, the exam format will, is intended to be similar to that of the homework, except that it will be timed and uh, use this online proctoring system. Question three, are there any other estimated fees other than tuition, such as software, ancillary fees, etc.? There will be uh, $20 roughly uh, for some lab kits for some courses and for the students who opt to do the non-credit version of a course first, there will be a monthly fee that they would pay to Coursera and aside from that, it's just the tuition. So we have no university fees and the only yeah. costs in addition to tuition for four credit are 
kits in certain embedded systems courses. Mm -hmm. Next question, can we mix and match specializations? Example, a mix of embedded systems and power electronics. Sure, You're, uh, to earn the master's degree, all you need is 30 credit hours and you can uh, choose whichever courses you like. Next question, how different will these be from the ones already on Coursera? These are going to have a final exam. They'll have the assistance, as Dr. Erickson mentioned, of a um, course, facilitator. course facilitator who's a, a, akin to a TA. And there will also be um, perhaps additional homeworks, quizzes, whatnot. But, but we have endeavored to keep the four credit version outside of the exam module to be uh, as close as possible and nearly the same as the non-credit version. Question six. I have an undergrad in mechatronics engineering, which is heavily mechanical. Can I send you a list of courses to confirm that I'm covering the prerequisite knowledge required? I believe you could do so and we can, um, you know, run it by instructors and they can maybe comment on which other courses might be necessary for foundational work, yes. Okay. But I would suggest give the non-credit version a try and see how yeah. it goes. Yeah. Good point. Next question. Does it cost extra to complete a certificate? What are the benefits of the certificate? The certificate costs only the tuition. Yeah. There is no additional charge. Um, it is a... Um, university and graduate school um, uh, operated credential. It's, it is less than a full degree, but um, it is a credential that appears on your transcript. Um, our power electronics certificate has been running for about 20 years now and is pretty well known in industry, but it's not the same as a full master's degree. But it's quite helpful for people who expect to be many of the students taking this particular degree program who are full-time workers in industry to both give them very specialized expertise in a, set of, in a set of skills that can help them both perform their job better and to get raises and uh, improvements in their position. So they're very worthwhile to get either standalone or together with your degree in this program. Okay. Um, next question. Is there a preliminary list of all courses that you expect to offer? I'm interested in a mixed offering covering RF antennas, FPGAs, and embedded systems. I believe we have on our website already a list of uh, a lot of the courses that will be coming online during the next year or two, and that may continue to grow as faculty are able to upload more. And it does include those mm -hmm. courses in those areas you mm -hmm. just listed. Yeah. Next question. In Canada, there's a distinction between a thesis-based master's and a course-based, coursework-based master's. A thesis-based master's is the only one eligible for a PhD. Will we have an option to do a thesis? No, this is a coursework-based master's. And because of the distance and high volume of the program, we don't offer a thesis option. To get that, you have to attend our resident degree program. And as for PhDs in the U.S., it may differ from Canada. I know at our own campus, this is perfectly fine. As a, a course, only master's is perfectly fine as preparation for PhD subsequent to the, the course work. Yes, exactly. Yes. So if they're looking to pursue PhD in Canada, this would not work for them. But if in the U.S., in the U.S., yeah, them. many universities. I think they should check with the particular yes. university. Yeah, I too. wouldn't <laughs> say the whole broad base. Yeah. Any country, whole country so. would say that. No. Yeah, it's a good advice. Um, when you flip non-credit courses to four credit and the homework is evaluated, will you get a chance to redo it if you don't get a 3.0? In, in these classes, you can continue to uh, redo your homework. So you get unlimited attempts in nearly all of the courses. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, you can continue to update or upgrade your, your homework scores until the eight-week session is concluded. Great. 
Next question. I completed the Power Electronics Specialization V1 already. Can that count towards this program? So that specialization was non-credit. Mm. So it, it, to obtain credit, it would still be necessary to pay tuition, sign up for the four credit versions, uh, and the take the exams. Of, of version two of power specifically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. The four credit will be version two. Yeah. Yes. That's all clarification. Next question. Will the four credit courses ensure all required materials are noted up front? All required materials. I'm guessing yes. perhaps that means if they have to purchase the lab packets or anything like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that the, the course syllabi or will will stay what is necessary, what are concerned necessary materials for yes. the course. Yes. Um, next question is when, where will the syllabi of the initial courses be available to view? I would, I would imagine we will eventually have those on our websites, if not already, and, okay. and that uh, they'll also be available um, close to the time that they're enrolling. Right after they enroll, they should be able to get access as well. Okay. Are the quizzes going to be timed? And are the quizzes and exams, can you retake them with the highest score taken as the final grade? Generally, so this is at the discretion of the instructor. I can say, though, that generally the exams are timed, mm -hmm. uh, and generally they can only be taken once. Okay. I, might, I might add that students will be able to retake an entire course one time only for whichever, any course in, in, out of all the offerings, they could retake any of the courses, um, but they can only retake the same exact course one time. So that's their second opportunity to uh, retake the final exam and the other exams. Now that said, their sub their subsequent see if they if they redo that, then both grades will appear on their transcript. There will be the opportunity as well for what's called grade replacement, and they can do that for a maximum of six credit hours out of the thirty total required for the degree. And in that case, the subsequent attempt of the course, whatever that grade for stronger or weaker than the original grade, that will be the one that counts on the transcript. Okay. Next question, how can I look up information about the accreditation associated with this degree? I believe that's on our website. Yes, HLC, Higher Learning Commission. There is a link, I think, that right? There's a link on our website to the HLC, mm -hmm. which yeah. is the regional accreditor yeah. for this program. Thank you. Next question. Do you anticipate any problems um, in acquiring the lab kits for the embedded track, for example, internationally? What's the timing for purchasing the hardware, as in before, after October 21st? So we have arranged with DigiKey to provide these lab kits, and DigiKey is able to ship um, all over the world to any any country that uh, I guess the U.S. allows it to ship to. So that's nearly all of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I am about to finish the embedding sensor specialization by paying the subscription fee. Will I need to do extra assignments to switch to the full credit? The additional work will be the exams. So each each course has an exam that is in addition. And, and if, if I understand the phrasing of that question, there's no extra work prior to switching over to the four credit option. They would switch to the four credit option and then there would be the, the exams to do afterward. Yeah. Okay. Right. Next question. What if someone fails to get a grade of B or better in a pathway specialization? Does one need to pay the tuition again? What are the options for the second chance? I think you touched on this a little bit. Actually, they could get as low as a C, but the, the grade point average of those courses in, in the pathway that comprise the pathway courses for the specialization, the average has to be a 3.00. They should not get lower than a C, a solid C, not a C minus, but a solid C. 
in order to still qualify as long as their GPA in that set of courses, as well as their overall GPA of all courses in this program is a 3.0, then they're fine. And, and again, there's that option to retake a specific course one time. Mm -hmm. If you retake yeah. a course, you have to pay the tuition again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there specific times that you must take the exam, or is there a requirement only to complete all of the work, exams included, by the end of the eight weeks? The students can, will actually make an appointment with Proctor U to schedule when they will take the exam, but the exams will be available around the clock, exam times. And uh, then the work should be completed by the end of the eight week session. Mm -hmm. Um, um, will there be a course that will require a hands-on project instead of a final exam? There are, there are selected courses that have projects. Mm -hmm. um, there are, in particular, there are hands-on or hardware projects in the embedded systems area this is not practical in the other areas um, because of the cost. <clears throat> uh, we do have selected courses that have other kinds of projects as well. For example, in power electronics, we have a project course uh, that is based on an independent design and uh, uh, simulations. Um, so, yes, <laughs> in, a, in a limited, <laughs> yeah. limited, yes. Next question. Are you anticipating that the courses will fill up relatively fast, seeing that 75 students for each pathway can be in the October launch? That only leaves 225 total slots. Also, how many people have declared their intent to do the program? So we have about 10 times that many declarations of intent. Yeah. So we have room for about 10% of those declarations. And I do expect that the, the courses for this limited run will fill up very quickly. And I'm sorry, we have to limit enrollment, but we're really doing this because we expect that something is likely to go wrong. And this is just a limited launch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a test to, to smooth things out for all future iterations and right. everything will be open wide to all people who want to study in all classes come January. After completing a number of credits and admission to the program, will online students be eligible for TA positions? <clears throat> um, so we have course facilitators. We don't call them teaching assistants. Um, generally, we are hiring our on-campus students to provide that role. Um, I wouldn't rule out that we couldn't hire somebody else, but we, the university has to be able to hire them. And so for international students, for example, there are visa problems with that. And even for a domestic student, um, we can't necessarily hire the person. Mm -hmm. So we're limited by what the campus is allowed to, to do. Well, that's not exactly a <laughs> black and white answer, but mm. um, yeah. yeah. Um, next question. Specifically for the embedded courses, will there be expectations for programming knowledge other than C, C++, and HDL? HDLs. Might have to run that by the ESC faculty. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think most of the courses, uh, that's the list. Okay. All right, next question. Uh, since I am in Boulder, is it possible to meet for office hours in person, or is there any advantage to being local? Uh, this is a distance program, so there's no advantage <laughs> to being local. And uh, our uh, office hours will be held by Zoom, and they'll be available around the world. So we don't, we don't, don't even actually have a meeting space. Mm -hmm. to... 
Next question, in regards to currently working, what is your personal opinion on the feasibility of also taking the courses to complete this degree in two years? Uh, we discussed that and, and mathematically it looks as if for a full-time worker, it would be reasonable to, to assume about three and a half to about four or five years. Uh, a full-time student with little to limited work hours might be able to finish in about two to three years. Um, but for full-time workers, three and a half probably is more reasonable for the pacing. It, it depends on your personal situation yeah. and how yeah. much time you have. Mm -hmm. Definitely. If I'm unable to complete the course during the eight weeks, what will happen to my enrollment? So if you don't complete the course and you let the eight weeks roll, you know, wind up and you don't do anything about it, you'll get an F mm -hmm. and it will go on your transcript. So we don't want that. Now you have the opportunity to, uh, to drop the course within two, two weeks of when you signed up and get a full refund. Or if it's after the two weeks, but before the end of the eight weeks, you can withdraw from the course where you won't get a refund, but you won't get a grade. You, well, you will get a W on your transcript actually yes, for a withdraw. withdraw grade, but it won't be a grade that figures into your grade point average. Right. And the withdraw grade doesn't really, it's just have, a marker. it doesn't have any negative connotation. Right. Um, so, so it is your responsibility to, to withdraw or drop before the eight weeks are up if you can't finish the course. And one other qualification on this statement is that uh, if you at any time would open up the proctored assessments, any of the exams or whatnot, that would prohibit you from either dropping or getting a refund. So be very careful. Withdrawing. Yes. 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 Once you open, once you start the final exam, you're committed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, this is a bit of a long question. Will there be an, any opportunity for student-faculty interaction beyond that provided by office hours with course facil facilitators? For example, would this program enable students to establish a rapport or relationship that could lead to letters of reference or recommendations useful in finding employment or applying for future academic programs? This is a high volume degree and there's a limit to what we're able to do. So, um, I, we aren't going to be able to have the faculty writing thousands of letters. Um, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> okay. Next question, is there a limit to the number of credits you can take at one time? If we are able to complete the courses earlier than eight weeks, can we take six credits in what would be a traditional semester? You can. Just make sure you can handle it. But if you can, yeah. yes, you yes. That's part of the flexibility of the program. <laughs> you can go at your own pace within that eight week period. Just encourage you to finish everything up within the eight weeks. Mm -hmm. But if you can cram in a lot more and you're great at it, then go for it. Okay. Is there a way to finish the program in less than two years? There's no time uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. If you can do 30 credit hours in an eight week session, then you can earn the degree. <laughs> That's not gonna happen, but, but uh, there's no time, minimum time limit. I would advise most people, and some individuals may know they're very capable of doing this very high and fast rate, but I would advise most people to pace yourself at least the beginning, just to gauge what an average course will take you to do on per week on the assignments, the quizzes, the homework, et cetera, and then build up from there based yeah. on knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this one, uh, this question is asking for a clarification. What I meant was, is there a specific day that the exam will take place or it can be taken or can it be taken much earlier within the eight weeks window? I think it, you mentioned this. it can it, be taken at any time. Okay. Yeah. Can especially for more? those who have already completed the non-credit version. Mm -hmm. Effectively, they may have only, uh, exam portion left to do and they can do that very quickly mm -hmm. uh, in a relative scale is eight weeks okay. yeah right but you could transfer all of your homework over from the non-credit mm -hmm. to the credit on yeah. the first day of the yeah. session and then take the exam yes okay I would encourage those however who, who, who opt not to do the non-credit version again to enroll as close to the start of the eight weeks as they can to be able to have the full eight weeks available to them if they necessary and the the 
for credit also generally has at least one practice exam, which mm -hmm. you might want to do before mm -hmm. <laughs> scheduling the real thing. We really try to give you a lot of tools to succeed in this, you know, both encouraging you first to do the non-credit version, to get familiar with the coursework, the math involved, uh, the types of, of homeworks and whatnot, and as well as the opportunity, as Dr. Erickson said, to repeat homeworks even within the, um, the four credit version. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is a, also more of a clarification question. How much C programming is required to pursue embedded systems program? Most of the courses involve C programming, not all of them, but um, uh, C programming is a good background. Uh, there is some opportunity to learn C, but it'd be a good idea to have that at least. Okay. Next question. Is there a team or group-based home? Next question. Will students get real diplomas upon graduation? Yes. Yes. And on those diplomas, there's no indication that this is an online course. It's just a regular campus diploma. Next question. How many credits should I have to enroll in one semester? Is there any minimum requirement? There's no minimum. And there's no and semesters. There's no semester. <laughs> <laughs> it's the eight week yeah, eight-week session. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, what is de the department grade policy match to percentage? I'm not quite sure I understand that. Maybe you guys do. The faculty will determine the grade scale within their individual classes. Now, and the, now the grade scale will tra translate to a standard, you know, B is 3.0, A is 4.0, that type of mathematical scale for the course grade, but within the grade itself, there's... So the instructor should post the scale mm -hmm in the syllabus or other informational page in their course. Mm -hmm. So for example, in my power electronics course, a, the A range is 90 to 100% and the B range is 80 to 89 mm -hmm. and so on. Okay, great. Next question, will we receive a, a .edu email to be eligible for a student discount for the FPGA boards? Once you are, um, once you're admitted, mm -hmm. is that right? But once you're admitted as a student, then you will get a camp, what we call a campus identity, and you will get a colorado.edu email address. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Next question, will peer graded assignments always have graders? I struggle with this on non-credit courses. So we try, this depends on the course, most of us are trying to avoid peer grading, but there are a few cases where it makes sense be based on the nature of the assignment. Uh, when we have peer grading, then we, we will always have at least the course facilitators for the four credit version overseeing that. Um, because I know there are often um, problems and consistency of peer grading. Next question. I recently took ECEN 5797 Intro to Power Electronics via Distance Education and Pay Tuition, and it is listed on my CU, tra or my CU transcript. Do I need to take the corresponding Power Electronics Gateway course again? With our current rules, the answer is yes. Yeah, under the current <laughs> rules, because you can't transfer anything into this program. The converse would not be the same. You could change your thing. Sorry about that on one. Campus, but, yeah. Yeah. Next question. Is HDL knowledge required before starting the FPGA design for embedded systems specialization? I think HDL is, or learning HDL is one of the points of that course. So I would expect that, um, I'm answering for the, the instructor, which maybe I shouldn't, but I, I expect that HDL is taught along the way in that course. In January, there will be eight specializations open. Is this correct? When will other specializations be available? So that's correct. Eight, 
eight in January, and then we have a schedule of launching additional ones every two months. So we have some more that will launch in March, uh, and then another set in, in May. Next question. Can you start each eight-week session at any time, any date uh, of the year, or are there specific dates? There will be specific dates. There will be six eight-week sessions throughout the year. Um, I'm sure these will be on our website, if not already. Uh, the one limitation is that you will not be able to enroll for a course in the sixth week due to the refund policy of two, 14 days. Um, Conversely, however, you can roll for the next session coming up those two weeks early. So, so there is a schedule of yeah. exact dates yes. for when each of the eight week sessions starts. Right. Out. And this is this is to accommodate our, our university, which is supporting this program very strongly um, for administrative purposes. We had to make specific dates for purposes of the um, tuition and the grading, et cetera. And marking up diplomas okay. and issuing. Next question. Um, how much time commitment would a four credit course require for an average student? Typically, uh, an on campus graduate course might require nine hours a week, including three hours of lecture and six hours of homework. Mm -hmm. um, here, the the lectures are more compact, so they're the same material is covered in maybe one or one and a half hours, mm -hmm. but there's still the same amount, maybe six hours of work required to do the homework for that module. Thank you. Next question. For the exams, are you going to have to memorize formulas and concepts, or are you allowed to use your notes on the exams? This is at the discretion of the instructor. Um, Many of these exams, because of the proctored format, um, will, will be very limited. So the intent is not to have memorization, but it may still be closed book. Um, and calculators are pretty difficult nowadays because of all the calculators on phones with web access. So maintaining the integrity is a challenge. So many of the exams um, will be closed book, closed notes, no calculators. Um, in order to make such an exam work, the you know, and to be a reasonable exam, that really limits the kinds of questions, and they're actually simpler questions as a result. But there's something that you ought to be able to still do without excessive memorization, as long as you've done the homework. Mm -hmm and mastered it. But it, some instructors may allow notes, for example, and typically they will publish the required formulas as part of the, the exam. Next question. Will the embedded systems specializations cover real-time operating systems and multi-threaded applications? We have courses in the works in those topics, yes. How can we guarantee that the online degree has the same on-campus quality without a research or a thesis? Our on-campus degree does not require research or a thesis. So this is the same, the same kind of courses, the same, it taught at the same level as our on-campus master's degree. Will we have more than one chance to get admission if the first try does not go well, less than the passing grade, three point GPA, with the initial try, excuse me, will the initial try be on the transcript? Any courses that are taken for credit will appear on the transcript, mm -hmm. yes. And again, this is performance based, so you need to prove that you do have the ability to pass these initial set of pathway courses in order to be admitted to the program. That's the point of, of, of that type of admissions process. And then, yeah. Um, next question, how does the lab work fit into the online version of the degree? So certain, uh, I guess there's a couple of answers to that. First of all, on campus, you can get the degree with no lab work. 
you you simply need to take 30 credit hours of courses. Um, we do offer graduate labs in certain areas on campus. Uh, in some cases, those lab that lab material is offered through this degree program. And again, that's primarily in the embedded systems area where we can do it and the, the price or the cost of that is, is reasonable. So where we have a simple little board that you can get from DigiKey and plug into your laptop to do the experiments. Um, in other areas, like in the RF area, in the power electronics area, in the optics area, um, the lab equipment is very expensive and it's not practical to do at a distance, so we don't. What prerequisite knowledge would we need to be successful in this program? I'd say high levels of math, um, STEM background, maybe a you know, specific math. So, so we, um, uh, we, we're actually putting together right now a um, open free course with sample uh, background questions uh, to test prerequisite knowledge. And one thing we've seen is that the prerequisite knowledge we're assuming in the three different areas, embedded systems, power electronics, and optics, is pretty different. Mm -hmm. And that's natural. That's yeah. just the nature of the fields, and it's the way it is for the on-campus courses as well. So in the power electronics area, really, we're assuming uh, knowledge of undergraduate circuits and electronics. Um, in the embedded systems area, it's knowledge of undergraduate uh, digital logic and, and basic microprocessor knowledge. And in the optico optics or optoelectronics area, it's knowledge of um, calculus three, which is multivariable calculus, and uh, knowledge of basic physics, like electricity and magnetism. Okay, so all of these are things that are taught in our undergraduate curriculum. Next question, what about the version one of power electronics specialization? What happens to that? Is that no longer relevant? It's very relevant. Version two is not very different from version. First material has been reorganized. So, um, but if you took version one of power electronics, you'll find version two is quite familiar. And uh, in some cases, the uh, assignments are unchanged. Um, next question, will this degree be recognized by professional engineering associations in the U.S., or will they require additional FE exams? So, um, licensure and professional engineering um, varies from state to state, so I can't speak for all 50 states. I can speak for uh, the state of Colorado, and I assume most other states will be the same, but... Um, this, this degree, master's degree, will count the same way that the resident ma master's degree counts. So for the FE exam, in fact, that requires uh, the undergraduate degree, not the master's degree. And none of the master's degrees are relevant to the FE exam. What, what the master's degree does is grant additional credit of work experience towards the seven years required before being able to sit for the, the professional engineering exam. And the, um, this degree will count in the same way for that. Um, I believe it gives one year of uh, credit towards the seven years, so just as our, our resident master's degree would. Okay, um, let's do one more, two more, and then I invite you to wrap up. Um, what is the procedure we need to follow if, by any chance, something technological fails when trying to take the proctor exam? You need to contact the proctor and, and the proctor will deal with it. So proctor U is very good and used to dealing with these things. Okay. Next question. Will the FPGA pathway be available in January? Uh, will it? <laughs> 
the FPGA be available in January? We, we, we anticipate it will be, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thank you guys so much for doing all of these amazing questions and answers. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us from around the world today. And um, please, if you have not done so yet, please sign up uh, for the Declaration of Intent those are the individuals who are going to be getting the exclusive offer to sign up for um, this uh, degree program and the pathway specialization on Monday morning. And they will have a couple days before the rest of the, um, it's open to the rest of the community. So thank you everybody. Thank you, Bob and Adam. And have a wonderful day. And hopefully we'll see everybody on Monday. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Hey. <laughs>